I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Galway. Uh, he is a social historian of China and Southeast Asia, especially Cambodia, where he has lived and done research. Uh, his re research focuses on communism in Southeast Asia and how Maoism interacted with indigenous influences. Uh, some of his broader research interests include <coughs> colonialism and neocolonialism, ideology and culture, Southeast Asian history, the history of the Chinese Communist Party, and transitional friendship associations in <coughs> Southeast Asia and Latin America. And he's currently working on a postdoc at the University of California, California at Berkeley. So I'd like to welcome him and get him started because you came here to listen to him and not me. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Bishop. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I have to really thank a, a, a ton of people for this opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, I mean, I'm so grateful for this, uh, this chance to, to share this research. Uh, well, a lot of my research comes through in this lecture, uh, and uh, I, I really look forward to sharing uh, these ideas with you. But uh, first and foremost, of course, the International uh, Studies Institute for the opportunity. Uh, Professor Bishop list, listed the uh, the donors or the uh, donors, uh, the the kind of beneficiaries or the benefactors of this. So I'm grateful for that. And I'd also like to thank uh, my good friend and colleague, Professor Ian Stewart, without whom none of this would even be possible. So uh, without with that, uh, we begin uh, China's great global leap. I've got a great uh, Cultural Revolution era propaganda poster there. Uh, it reads, the, world, the whole world's people's uh, resistance to American imperialism will surely succeed. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that there's just a, a, a very, and it, it's of course uh, has a, a symbolic importance. You have you know, someone who's supposed to represent Africa, someone who's supposed to represent Latin America, someone who's supposed to represent Southeast Asia, Vietnam. Of course, you've got somebody on the far, uh, I guess it's my far left, but your far right, in the kind of traditional Indonesian uh, hat. Uh, so there's, or Javanese style hat. So it, it's to kind of really show that China's viewing itself amongst these, revol or these, these revolutionary peoples and this movement against imperialism. So, um, I always start off uh, my talks on topics like this by quoting one of my favorite authors and philosophers, Albert Camus, who was a, a pied noir or French Algerian uh, philosopher, uh, founder of absurd absurdism. Uh, the two quotes there, I think, really kind of capture some of the themes we're going to be looking at today. The spirit of rebellion can only exist in a society where a theoretical equality conceals a great factual inequality. And then rebellion cannot exist without a strange form of love. And I think these are all really um, important quotes from L'Homme Révolté, or The Rebel. Um, and and I, think, I think you'll kind of get a sense of where a lot of these things are coming from. So uh, first and foremost, the outline. I'll, I'll be introducing kind of the slow work of Mao's socialist revolution and the birth of his ism, Maoism, or his thought. Uh, then kind of looking at what I exactly mean by the global leap. Uh, what is that? And I'm looking at the three specific dimensions of it, export, personal witness, and mass translation and dissemination. I've termed this for my manuscript project as red evangelism. I look forward to people kind of picking apart my uh, term choices there. And then uh, some kind of tentative conclusions um, after we're looking at some, some kind of case studies. All of these will tie in uh, throughout. So uh, just some, some main kind of things to focus uh, on. Uh, the Sino-Soviet split, or China and the Soviet Union, both communists no longer uh, seeing eye to eye. Uh, 1960s kind of the, I guess, most agree is, is when it really reaches its boiling point. Uh, during this, 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 this schism between the Soviet Union and China, Mao and his party, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, seek actively to move the Chinese Revolution in a direction where it's not just happening in China, but it inspires movements outside China. So it's this way of kind of transmitting the Chinese experience and revolution to the world. Uh, this shift in relations with the Soviets puts China in a position where it can set an ideological example for others to follow. With leaders and theorists, specifically Mao, but also others like Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, uh, stressing the worldwide suitability of China's revolutionary historical experience, specifically as a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country. So a country that wasn't completely subjected to colonialism and a country that 
uh, specifically in the rural areas, had a system of feudalism that was still keeping the country from moving forward uh, in terms of, of industrialization and, um, and, and modernization, quote unquote. Uh, and and then, uh, then looking at the three things of, of red evangelism, the main charge that I make is, is that Mao specifically pursues an ideologically charged foreign policy, but the goal was never to direct foreign revolutions from Beijing. This is a, a position that uh, a lot of cold warriors, uh, historians-wise, would, would say that China was trying to influence and, and direct uh, movements like the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese Communist Party. Uh, this is not true. In many cases, uh, China becomes kind of a secondary, even a tertiary influence in those movements. And these, these local uh, movements happening in Southeast Asia and elsewhere really take on their own uh, domestic character. And uh, I've got... a. a my, my obligatory reference uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, classical China, the looking at the, the land under heaven, the Qianxia, and then the uh, emperor's de. So this idea that, that China was trying to posit itself very much as like the, the center where all the other surrounding countries, including the world uh, or across the world, would kind of grow to adopt those, the, the methods that, that China was uh, doing, but of course never forcefully. So, uh, as I see at the bottom there, center of world revolution was never the intended uh, center from which orders were issued. So, talking a lot about this Maoism and Mao, uh, I think it's important to kind of look at, you know, just what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about the Chinese experience or Chinese ideology uh, or Maoism. So Mao, the Mao Zedong, uh, important Marxist uh, theorist, uh, so this uh, grows up in, in a rural upbringing. Uh, not necessarily uh, an impoverished upbringing, but it was certainly rural. Uh, moves to uh, all across, uh, moves to several cities. I think he's based in Beijing and then in Shanghai thereafter. But um, he becomes a very important figure in the Chinese Communist movement after dabbling in anarchism and, and uh, liberalism for a period of time, as, as many Marxists did at the time. Uh, but eventually he finds himself as among these, these, these great, you know, motivated uh, thinkers who want to create a new China. They see what's going on in the, the Republic of China, the, the era of, 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 uh, of, of Chiang Kai-shek or Jiang Jiaxi, and they see that the, the, the issues that plagued China for many years during the imperial period have not necessarily gone away. They've, in fact, reproduced and gotten worse. Uh, so, socioeconomic uh, inequality, for instance, corruption, um, you know, domestic, like the violence in, in China, specifically in, in uh, the rural areas. Uh, so he, he and others say, well, what, what can we do to fix the situation? So Mao, as, as a fledgling Communist Party member, uh, finds himself in Hunan reporting on a peasants' movement. And he reports that, wow, you know, all this, all this stuff about the cities as the locus of the next revolution, uh, that, that might not be the case for us. Maybe we should look to the peasants as this major motive force for China's revolution. Uh, at no point in the, in the pieces, and including the subsequent writings, is he saying they should lead it. Um, he is, after all, still a Marxist, so very much urban proletariat-centric. But he sees that as kind of the spark to set the prairie fire of the Chinese revolution. Get the majority peasants who are the most aggrieved, the most impoverished, get them on board and they'll be the kind of motive force for you. And he develops this over the next 20 years um, as he moves his way on up the Communist Party hierarchy to eventually become its general secretary. Uh, he writes in several pieces that I've got listed there on practice, on contradiction, on protracted war, on the new stage, and then on new democracy. These pieces are kind of the hallmark examples of what historians call the Yan'an period, where Mao is writing his most important theoretical works. So you don't have to copy this down, but just to get a sense of, of what he's doing in these pieces, on practice is, is his kind of philosophical engagement with the idea of knowing and doing, essentially stating that there, are new, there is no knowing or truth without practice. What he's trying to get at is say, rather than sit around at a, at a table and discuss a proper theory, we should just put it into practice and then go back to that table and discuss the experience of that practice so that we can come up with a concrete theory grounded in practice. So this is important kind of in keeping with the theme of slow work for today and in keeping with the global revolution that he and others, other Communist Party members are trying to inspire. This is really important because for years and years and years and years, 
Marxists or, you know, specifically leftist progressives were trying to decide which theory they should use. And this practice-based theory really em emphasized, or this practice-based kind of uh, approach really says, well, just stop thinking about it. Stop kind of necessarily just talking about dogmatism or ideas. Get right to the actual practice of, of the revolution. Then you can discuss theory. Contradiction is another element. We'll get into it a, uh, a little bit later, but this also has a significance. There's this idea that contradictions are everywhere, and just because a situation does not fit the mold specifically does not necessarily mean that you cannot fit that situation to the mold. Um, so this is important and specifically in the Chinese context because it is not a European industrialized country. It is, it's got a few urban centers that have uh, uh, industrial uh, production, but it's by and large not comparable to say a, you know, a major European country, even Russia. Uh, so the conditions aren't really there for a, a, a kind of the same type of proletarian-led revolution. So you have to amend things a little bit. So contradiction allows you to reconcile those differences and just kind of accept that they're always going to be there and not let that kind of dictate how you proceed. So this is, this is a little kind of graphic. I usually hate these types of things. As a historian, I like names and dates and stuff. But this is from uh, Nick Knight's book, Rethinking Mao. And it's uh, a kind of a way of looking at Mao's idea of theory practice theory. So you have a theory, but don't sit at the table. Go put it into practice. Then come back to the table, and you have a theory. Hmm. Right? And this is the, one of the most important pillars of Mao Zedong Sisiang, Mao Zedong thought, the idea of theory practice theory. And this eventually becomes the most fundamental aspect of Sinified Marxism, or Chinese Marxism, which is inseparable from Mao Zedong Sisiang or Mao Thought. So, uh, you know, again, guides to action. These are all familiar types of things. I can come back to that later if people are interested. But um, over those 20 years that Mao's writing, and, and specifically in Yan'an, where he's bringing people together to support his direction and his ideas, and as he's rocketing up the Communist Party hierarchy to supreme theorist, which he is by, uh, by the mid-1940s, uh, he's, he's kind of formulating those, those, those important pillars that really become inseparable from Mao thought and really become uh, very, very sexy for uh, movements outside China. So new democracy is a big one. Uh, the mass line, uh, I'll get into these next slide, contradiction we've covered. People's war, so like guerrilla warfare, protective warfare, um, emphasis on practice. And then later, after China becomes communist, uh, a communist country in 49, after the uh, communists are able to turn the tides against, use a lot of these strategies against the ruling Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, when they establish the People's Republic of China in 49, they continue to implement these uh, in the forms of, 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 of these actual policies, agrarian socialism, uh, widespread collectivization, and then the three worlds theory and permanent revolution, which are important for our themes of slow work today. So uh, on those, breaking down those, those uh, components, a new democracy is the idea that chi the Chinese revolution has two stages, the, the democratic and the socialist one. I know that sounds really, really simplistic. I could go on all day about it. But the long and short of it is, is that China needs to move it, take its movement and bring in a lot of people towards it. Not necessarily everyone has to fit their uh, kind of harsh Marxist goals or, or, or um, um, model. So you can bring in bourgeoisie, you can bring in capitalists, you can bring in anybody. As long as the movement is growing and moving towards overthrowing the, uh, the kind of the people in power. And of course, this, 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 will, this will change over time. And then it, will, then it can proceed, after taking power through moving from the countryside to the cities, it can proceed with the socialist revolution. Uh, the mass line is the idea that the Communist Party must listen to the grievances of peasants and workers and interpret the feedback that they're getting and the ideas that they're getting from that personal communication uh, within the framework of Marxist-Leninism and then enforce uh, policies grounded in them. Uh, contradiction we've covered. People's warfare is uh, protracted war, so the idea that you know, if you are a smaller, technologically inferior force, you can you know, use a kind of a combination of you know, drawing the enemy into areas that are more favorable for your attack or for, for your situation uh, in war, and then use, it, use that terrain against them and eventually kind of bleed the enemy dry to the point where they don't want to fight you anymore. This is very big in places like Vietnam 
Uh, they used it to great effect, so I've heard. Um, and then, uh, and then of course, practice. So, uh, so just kind of on the the third worldism or three worlds theory, I've got um, a nice picture of a jolly chairman Mao uh, talking with uh, Kenneth Kaunda, who was the uh, first president of Zambia. And uh, the, the whole idea of the three worlds theory, he, he kind of fleshes out in this interview that they have. So it's the idea that, that and I, I always put this in here because Mao at no point ever says that China is aligned with the second world or the first world. He is always from 49 onwards saying that China is part of the third world. Our experience as a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country makes us part of the greater movement against imperialism, against colonialism. So he's saying, well, the, you know, the, and this is in uh, kind of the 19, late 1960s, early 70s. Um, he's saying essentially that the United States and the Soviet Union are part of the same problem, that the Soviets, since the 60s onward, have become imperialist in their own right by expanding their interests in other countries instead of committing themselves to the, the all-important goal of world communism. Of course, the United States, you know, uh, its, its dealings in, in, uh, in, in the developing world, a, a locus of contestation for both Mao and the Soviet Union. But China, in Mao's view, is alongside the newly independent countries of Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. And Mao's emphasis that we are the third world becomes kind of a rallying, rallying cry uh, across the, the world of, quote-unquote, the co uh, persons of color. Uh, as we'll talk about later, Mao's appeal among um, uh, African Americans and you know, uh, per other, other, other persons in the 60s and 70s. I think I have something on Peru, too, but uh, I won't go too into that now. But yeah, so just kind of China emerges, emerging as this epicenter of a third world movement. But again, not trying to like say, we're going to direct everything from Beijing for our own purposes. Certainly, that, is, that, that figures in later on, but uh, the initial purpose is at least rhetorically, um, uh, you know, uh, sincere. So returning back to kind of the overarching theme of slow work, I'm always fascinated with Mao's idea of permanent revolution, which is the idea that the revolution is never really over. You may take state power, but then what? Well, you got to develop. You got to make all these programs. You got to implement these policies. You got to develop the country so that everybody's doing well. And even then, it, once the country is good, you got to bring it global, right? So there's this Mao reference, this, this great uh, myth called the, the foolish old man who removes the mountain. So I've got an, a painting uh, from around the, I, th I think this one's from 1966. But uh, it's this idea that the, the, myth, the myth is about this old 90-year-old man who has this really nice, or had this really nice view, or he wants a really nice view, but there are these two giant mountains blocking the way. So every day he goes and he starts removing, you know, stones one by one by one. And this other, this observer is like, what are you doing? You're never going to be able to move those mountains. And he says, well, yeah, I mean, sure, I might not be able to move them, but then my son will take up after me, and then his son will take up after me, and then eventually the mountains will be gone. So the, the kind of the, the, the big theme there is that, that it's, it, it, it's to stress the, the virtues of perseverance and willpower. These are two very important elements in Mao thought, right, specifically vol voluntarism and the permanence of revolution. And Mao interprets that as kind of in terms of collective action. Like we Chinese are always going to be committed to the permanent revolution of world socialism. And we have to be, in each and every one of us, as spirited as the foolish old man who moved the mountain. So he even uh, has this quote, which he mentions in 1945. Uh, Today, two big mountains lie like a dead weight on the Chinese people. One is imperialism. The other is feudalism. The Chinese Communist Party has long made up its mind to dig them up. We must persevere and work unceasingly, and we too will touch God's heart. Our God is none other than the masses of the Chinese people. If they stand up and dig together with us, why can't these two mountains be cleared away? So this is the kind of uh, the essence, the, the essence of, of, of Mao's idea of permanent revolution and collective action. And there's a, a, a kind of a, a bas relief uh, in Wuhan uh, depicting a socialist realist version or retelling of the foolish old man with, with equally happy results. Now that, those themes about this permanent revolution against imperialism is important when we think as we return to the sphere of kind of international relations and politics 
and slow work, specifically in terms of the non-aligned movement. Now, I mentioned you guys saw the, 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 uh, the slide that had uh, Kenneth Kaunda and Mao talking about the three worlds theory. Before Mao is even having that meeting, he's discussing with world leaders this idea of uh, China and other countries that don't want to side with the United States or the Soviet Union and play their superpower chess game should just not align themselves with either of them and develop socialism autonomously without the interference of these two. So here's a map from 1980 uh, depicting the countries that are, the blue countries are ones that are US affiliated or you know NATO specifically, so US affiliated. Uh, and then the red ones are Warsaw Pact, Soviet countries, Soviet aligned countries. And then the kind of grayish areas, which are not showing up on my computer well, but I'm glad they're showing up there, are the non-aligned countries. So mostly you know, South and Southeast Asia uh, and, and kind of spatterings throughout uh, Central and Southern Africa. Um, this is a, a map from 1980. So this, you, 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 importantly, if you go a little bit earlier, those, those kind of non-aligned or even red spots in South America and Central America are actually more, uh, more present. It is because of a lot of uh, American uh, kind of uh, adventurism in the 80s, specifically regarding countries like Nicaragua and, and in the 70s with Guatemala, that those things get kind of put down. But I won't go too into that. Um, so in terms of the rise of a non-aligned movement, this is very successful in newly independent countries uh, like Indonesia or uh, Burma uh, and Cambodia. Uh, these countries have representatives in Bandung in, in 1955 in Indonesia, and they commit to this idea of uh, non-interference and autonomous development. So it's the five peaceful principles of peaceful coexistence is what the name becomes and China adopts that as its foreign policy. That, that China will endorse movements against imperialism, endorse movements against colonialism and against corruption, but it will not interfere to the point where it is directing based on its own interests. Though it's kind of direct, it's kind of motivated by its interests as well, uh, because uh, many of those countries happen to share a border and at least are close by. So ultimately, it's very successful uh, among a lot of countries. There's the non-aligned movement has um, several meetings thereafter. And it's really kind of the middle point where, uh, the middle point of this crucial 18 years period, 49 to, to, to 65, even 66 really, uh, where China becomes the leader of the Third World Revolution where it's, it's, it's states that are, even though they have independence, if they don't have independence, China's endorsing them rhetorically, sub rosa sometimes, because they, they can't outright, um, to, to be free. And then if they are free, to endorse uh, leaders or representatives or even revolutionaries to make them freer, at least in the idea of you guys are independent, but you're not free. So let's find out a way to do that. So China becomes really an epicenter for this. And this really, a lot of countries are willing to accept China in this role because it itself is a nation state that won independence out of semi-colonial and semi-feudal country. Right? It, it shared a lot of the same historical experiences with them. It was a country that had to deal with uh, exploitation and corruption and widespread poverty, especially in the rural areas. That's why, of course, you don't have the level of development uh, that, that, that many uh, people believed in, in the, new, the, the new Republic of China, that it should have happened, or should have had. Now, during this 18-year this period, China is also embarking on a mass PR campaign, both domestically and internationally, um, during which they actually host a lot of people. Uh, whether they are communists or not is irrelevant. China's having pro-capitalist leaders, China's having pro-socialist leaders, they're having socialist curious leaders over and they're visiting Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, some more unsavory characters like Salazar aka Pol Pot are among some of the people who go over to China in the 1960s and they're there and they meet important figures, they're given the kind of royal, uh, the royal proceedings when they get there um, and they converse and they learn and they, they chat and they wax poetic and it's, it's really a great experience for China both on the domestic front because it shows to, at least from uh, you know, a, a propaganda standpoint, it shows to locals, uh, local Chinese, hey, you know, we're, we're winning this, this, this world uh, revolution. Look how many representatives are coming to us and not going to DC. And then internationally, it's softening the image of China, a country that is just removed from its involvement in the Korean War where it lost a lot of bodies. And removing its, uh, you know, it, it's kind of 
putting itself forward again as this as this very friendly nation that you know doesn't want to continue uh, the, the the rhetoric of the of the early 1950s uh, that that really wants to kind of just you know not fight India on a border dispute not get into an issue regarding Tibet that. It rather would, would like to be a rhetorical force for good and support countries that should have a right to independence. After all, um, you know, these, these countries were merely referencing Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, like Ho Chi Minh in Hanoi uh, in, in 1945, right? So they're, they're holding these ideas of, of independence and freedom uh, and saying these are things that we should all have. So, and then it's also during this period where. Uh, Chinese uh, two specific agencies. I'll get into them later. The Guoji uh, Shujian and the Foreign Languages Press, the, the International Bookstore and the uh, um, uh, Foreign Languages Press, are mass translating these ideas of Chairman Mao and these works into hundreds of, or dozens of languages, rather, but sending them to hundreds of countries, and uh, it's kind of creating a larger footprint for Mao's ideas. Uh, and I've got a copy there of a French language one of the quotations of Chairman Mao. Uh, which is big in, in Paris in the 1950s and 60s. So getting into the specific ideas of, of uh, red evangelism or the great global leap, we start off with export. So um, there are three specific efforts in third world outreach. I kind of touched on, on some of the ideas. The spirit of Bandung is, again, those five principles of peaceful coexistence. We'll, we don't have to agree with you, uh, but we want to make, you know, we want to support you in your movement towards autonomous development. Uh, you know, we'll help in any way possible. Then this all changes, of course, um, by 1965, when there's a more revolutionary approach. Um, it's actually even a little bit before that, where China is willing to kind of, uh, at least rhetorically, support revolutions, even though they can't go on record for doing so. So they're a little bit more covert about it. Uh, so, for instance, China sending rhetorical to su support for the uh, the Red Khmers or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Um, it had an alliance. Mao, of course, as that picture shows, and Zhou Enlai as well, who's right in that picture as well. Close personal friends of the Prince Sihanouk, who is the, uh, I guess, king at this point, the neutralist leader of, of Cambodia at the time. But at the same time, they still viewed him as a reactionary king who might change his allegiance any minute. So, And then there's the radical ideological approach, where essentially communist China is saying, we support communist movements, and we support them now more than ever. And that's much more overt. And uh, that happens, uh, that happens uh, spe specifically during the years of the Cultural Revolution. So um, during the first two periods, Zhou Enlai's personal diplomacy is very important. Zhou Enlai is a, one of the, probably the, I'd say the most important figure in the Communist Party's international outreach. He's very, very good at kind of softening the international uh, image of, of, of China to these fledgling independent countries. And his personal friendship with with people like Sihanouk, uh, there's there's all these great articles about um, uh, coming out now about that friendship. And even though the two didn't see eye to eye ideologically, they got along with each other in a kind of dialectical friendship. But of course, a lot of these newly independent countries want to remain neutral. It's picking a side got them exactly where they were in before the Bandung movement. So many of them are staunch in their neutrality, and Cambodia is no exception. So there we've got uh, the, the, the person who looks like he's having the most fun in the world, Zhou Enlai, is there in the front. And then you've got several other world leaders uh, going, going uh, back. But this, it's, uh, it's a, Bandung is a, the Bandung Conference, it's a colloquial name. It's actually the Afro-Asian Summit. Um, and the main reason why is, is you have the, essentially the, the, the majority, if not everybody who's there, is a representative of a newly independent or uh, developing African or Asian country. And it's in that solidarity of confronting those post-independence issues that they can kind of converse and move towards this goal. Now on to the, the hosting itself. Uh, again, there's the domestic international purpose. There's a picture of Mao with Sukarno, who is himself a neutralist, if not a socialist, uh, socialist curious. Um, he certainly was dabbling in it earlier in his career. And we all know how that happened, it ends in 65. But uh, there's Mao with Bako, Ho Chi Minh, in the bottom. Uh, having a laugh over tea, um, I, I wish I knew about what, but uh, but this idea again of, of meeting these people, uh, Ho Chi Minh obviously very very vocal in his by this point in his allegiance, but you know Mao had no real reason. I mean, this is a staunch Soviet ally, you know, and he's just like, yeah, let's meet and talk and laugh. And Sukarno is a neutralist, and he says, sure, let's meet, no problem. 
let's discuss ideas how to make this this you know global realignment work for us where where it's not just Soviet allies versus US allies we have a say and we shouldn't be sublimated in this and it's during this period where China's really trying to carve its own path both to socialism those in the early years of that 18 year period and then in terms of diplomacy so uh, Generally, I get a, a good laugh over this one. There's Che Guevara. Um, some of you have seen him on T-shirts and posters before. Um, but yeah, so he's there. Uh, he's a great admirer of Mao, uh, and uh, he, he visited in 62. Uh, then you have, uh, there's Zhou Enlai and, and Ho Chi Minh having a chat over dinner, or having a laugh over dinner. And then a very unsavory picture uh, of, of Pol Pot. He actually, the picture is from 1975. Pol Pot visited in 65, but he wasn't, uh, he was, he was not the leader of, the, of, of communist Cambodia at the time. He was just a representative. But he visited and he got China's, Chinese support rhetorically for, for his movement to take down Sihanouk. But I uh, would imagine that the, the, his reception would have been something like that. Mao is also meeting with important figures in, outside of necessarily kind of firm political leaders or, or revolutionaries, but he's meeting with, with important figures in the terms of kind of, I guess, I guess politics you could you could say, but maybe not not a not a hardcore politician, but somebody who certainly writes about politics and, and, and society. And this, so W. B. Du Bois goes to China and visits with Mao, and uh, I, I love that picture of, of Du Bois and Mao. This is again they're always happy, I guess. But um, Du Bois wrote in the the late '60s, "Come to China, Africa, and look around. You know America and France and Britain to your sorrow." Obviously, a reference to colonialism and imperialism. Now know the Soviet Union and its allied nations, but particularly know China. So know China separate of what you know of the Soviet Union. China is flesh of your flesh and blood of your blood. China is colored and knows to what the colored skin in this modern world subjects its owner. So there's this great, great article called Black Like Mao, which is in a, a, a little known journal called Souls. But it's, uh, it's a really good look at the rise of, of China as the epicenter of a colored people's movement. So in kind of the larger Atlantic uh, world, specifically, you know, the United States with the Black Panthers, and then in, in several cases in, in uh, kind of Western and then Southern and Eastern Africa, where China is like, hey, you know, like, they're also persons of color who resisted imperialism. We can too. So uh, just some, I always throw this in here because that's, this is some, I'm, I'm really fascinated with Sihanouk and, and his relationship with Zhou Enlai, but just some of the, an idea of the type of stuff they were writing about in Chinese language newspapers, and specifically one I came across called Mianhua Rebel, which is uh, sino Khmer Daily. It's written in three languages, which is cool in a newspaper, uh, but, uh, you know, ideas like, you know, the hearts of the people of China and Cambodia beat together. And the China-Cambodia friendship will forever be in bloom. So it's this idea that we've always got your back, and until they betray him, of course. Um, but uh, Sihanouk loved China. He loved Mao, and he loved Zhou Enlai. And even though he did not agree to communism, and he said, "I'm a Buddhist first, and you know, a, a neutralist second, He would. He visited China so many times. As, and here's he's visiting a factory in Shanghai, and you're plotting something with Mao. But um, he loved going, and he stayed, and this, he was always very well received. And Mao and Sihanouk had like, a, even though they didn't agree, they had a mutual respect for each other. And it, again, this is all important in kind of terms of looking at China outside China. You know, people saying, well, look, this guy is meeting with people. Uh, he and his, his lieutenants are meeting with people they don't even agree with. And uh, they're able to kind of listen to each other and get along, which is, again, that's a big PR move, a PR win for China. So uh, I won't go too into this, but uh, my own research talks about, you know, Pol Pot, and he visits... Uh, China in the 60s and uh, meets with several CCP officials and uh, he stays at the same place that uh, Sihanouk stayed at. It's the center for kind of a Asian, African, and Latin American revolutionaries, which is interesting that, you know, by 1965 China already has one of these. So again, that idea of, of exporting the revolution in full swing. And of course, the communists laud his Cambodia-centric program to overthrow Sinuk, but they can't do so overtly because then it would undermine that close friendship that I was just talking about with Sinuk. Now, uh, later on, China will encourage them to work with Sinuk, and that does not end well. So again, that's just a colored version of, of the picture that I showed earlier. This is from the Phnom Penh Post. Um, not in 65, though, but again, we'd imagine that it would look like that. 
Um, so uh, beyond hosting and fostering these relations and softening that kind of image of China outside of China, you have this really, really important distribution, uh, translation and distribution network of the seminal works of Mao thought and the Chinese revolutionary, that are grounded in the Chinese revolutionary experience. Uh, experience. So what happens is, is that, you know, the, uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, which is the military of, 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 of communist China, during the early to mid-1960s, they became kind of a test subject to see if they could, you know, to embolden them to be even better at their daily tasks and, and, and be better soldiers. They became kind of the guinea pig to see, okay, well, if we give them these small portable ver versions of Mao's texts and they read them every day, they'll become better soldiers and better communists because they'll be inspired by his majestic countenance and his vision, right? So this, this idea of, of Mao inspiring through his words, right? This is something that uh, Beijing believes is a great idea. So they create a small portable version of, of Mao's most resonating, most Im impactful quotes, and they give it to these soldiers and it becomes very popular, especially during the Cultural Revolution where young uh, Red Guards who are like, emboldened students uh, are, you know, throwing, you know, waving them to the skies and reciting them at ad nauseum. So China's like, this really worked domestically. Let's go international. Let's get these into English. Let's get these into French, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, you name it, let's do it. Now, it isn't the first endeavor in mass translation, but it is certainly the biggest case of it. You have pieces uh, in, in China that are getting translated into, uh, into Russian and then into French um, as early as 1950. <laughs> That's how a lot of the future uh, Vietnamese communists and uh, Cambodian communists get them when they're studying abroad in France. And then this, of course, blows up in 1965 with the Cultural Revolution and this larger interest, interest in China because of the hosting programs and because of these. And the hosting programs then leads to other things as well. So the Foreign Affairs Committee says, guys, let's do it. Let's have the Foreign Language Press, which is founded in 52, uh, translate and disseminate these things worldwide. Let's get them everywhere. So these are some, this is just from an antiques shop in, in, in Shanghai that I went to, but it's just modern day examples of what the translator versions of the Little Red Book would be. Um, portable, almost indestructible, as in vogue as bell bottoms in the 1960s. Everyone had one. I mean, I, 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 you know, when I was in, uh, in Vancouver talking to some students, I had a student come up to me say, you know, my mom had one of these when she was in the, you know, a student in the 60s. Yep. Uh, so it's just, just like, yeah, it was everywhere. It was just very, very pervasive. Uh, and you didn't have to necessarily be a communist to be interested in what Mao had to say. I mean, Mike Tyson has a tattoo of Mao on, on, his, on his shoulder, and I would hardly call him a communist theorist. So... <laughs> So, I mean, just to show just the widespread appeal of it, at least uh, from kind of a curiosity standpoint. And the foreign languages press by the 1960s is, is now, by Beijing's order, seeking to accelerate world revolution. So, at this point, China is taking a break from inspiring revolution and saying, hey, we're hands off, peaceful coexistence. It's now at a point where we're saying, oh, we got to just, we got to accelerate the world revolution. But we're not going to put boots on the ground for this. We're going to get everybody reading these books, and then they'll be emboldened to fight. So they distribute it millions and millions of copies. I mean, at one point, it's, it's, it, it surpasses the Bible in production. Uh, and it's, you've got Japanese, Russian, German, Italian, like everywhere. It's in Europe, uh, the streets of Paris in the 60s, for instance. Um, and they're just they're getting around. So it, and again, the, the hallmark of the Little Red Book's success is not necessarily solely the content, though that's certainly part of it, but it's, it's, it's that, that very kind of innovative, portable, accessible format. And you don't even have to be an expert in the language that it's in to get it. It's in these small kind of snippets where you're just kind of going, oh, well, you know, that quote, oh, and now if I want to read more about that, I can go to the newly translated selected works of Chairman Mao and read the whole essay that's been translated for me. So it becomes a reference guide and uh, it, uh, you know, a, a companion piece for a lot of uh, leftist zealots in the 60s for sure. So again, another picture of them. I think that's a deck of Chairman Mao playing cards. I'm not sure. I've got a few of those back home. But those are really fun, uh, you know, just in terms of what I call Mao-morabilia. Um, 
so these are these are uh, copies of the uh, English versions of uh, the selected works of Chairman Mao. So that follows uh, almost simultaneously with the mass translation and dissemination of the quotations of Chairman Mao, and it becomes kind of these. These I've got four volumes there. There's a fifth volume. Then there's Mao on diplomacy. So it becomes the ultimate companion piece for the, the true Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist, Maoist theorist. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I've got a copy of those. So. And then it, Mao continues to go mainstream. Uh, this is an Andy Warhol great. And actually, the one on the far right is I discovered that when I was at the Croc Collections in, uh, at Cornell University in Ithaca. They have an original copy of it. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> Ithaca. <laughs> So yeah, it's, I mean, this becomes big, and I mean, some of you may be familiar with this one, too. Um, Malby is still mainstream in many ways, you know, uh, sure as maybe a meme or a laughing point, but it's the, the, the kind of the semiotics of it, the, the symbols that it invokes, you know, resistance, re revolution, communism, the prominence of red, I mean, these are all important propaganda pieces, and of course, the fact that they put cat in Chinese there is, is big, too. So... Uh, and, and just an example of that pervasiveness and people who were swept up in that tide of, of Mao, kind of Mao centrism or Mao obsession is you have the founders of the Khmer Rouge who are studying in Paris. They're largely apolitical by the time they get to Paris in 49, 50, 51. I mean, some of them arrive earlier than others. Um, but by the time their country is independent in 53, many of them are are dissatisfied with the way that Sinhook's doing things already. They see a lot of corruption. They see this guy who doesn't commit to one style. He's not willing to, you know, help the progressive left. He's not willing, which is represented by the Democrat Party there. He just suppresses it and throws bloodless coups against them if they win elections. And then he, uh, if the rightists are too prominent, Sinhook is equally, uh, you know, repressive of them. Then eventually the rightists end up pushing a lot of the leftists out. But these guys are sitting in Paris saying, well, we're not getting what we wanted. We wanted a democratic country. Pol Pot even writes about that in 52 in a piece called Monarchy or Democracy, which I had the pleasure of translating in handwritten Khmer. Not fun. Uh, but um, he's the first to really write about these, these, these issues, these issues um, amongst the, 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 the four there. Uh, Hu Yun, of course, is, is, is an important figure as well. He's writing about uh, these in, 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 uh, actually around the same time, so I shouldn't say Pol Pot's the first. But Yun, Samfan, and Nim are all pursuing PhDs shortly after arriving in Paris, and they all go into economics, and they're applying a lot of the ideas that they're encountering in the texts that they're reading to the Cambodian context, right? It's this post-independent country that is still poor, largely rural, very corrupt, not developing the, the way that they want to see it develop. And they dabble in Stalinism and the French left, of course, you know, when you, the, politics back home aren't happening the way you want. You might veer left, you might veer right, they veer left. And in, after realizing that the Stalinism of the, especially with Stalin's death in 53, but the Stalinism of the French left is not really appealing to them, they then become Maoists. So they start to read Mao's works in French and have reading groups that are organized by the French Communist Party in Paris, during which they kind of have this, this comradeship of association as parent, students in Paris and they kind of coalesce around the ideas, the ways in which they can put these ideas into reason, like kind of meaningful practice in Cambodia. So not necessarily wholesale, calling for a revolution uh, against Sihanouk. I mean, he is their benefactor. He's the reason why they're in Paris doing these degrees. So not a good idea to, to bring attention uh, against him. And if, you know, so, but, but perhaps, uh, oops, my alarm. Uh, and uh, so, so they're, they're really drawn to, to, to that idea, but not necessarily going wholesale. So each of them uh, take, take kind of fit these ideas that Mao had presented in the Chinese experience to the Procrustean bed of, of the Cambodian experience. So and I always put a picture of just because I, I don't like any, any of, I mean, maybe Hunim a little bit because he's interesting, but by and large, these are all awful men who killed many people. So I always try and embarrass Kusem Fan by taking the picture where he's dressed up as Sita in the Ramayana, uh, and, and he looks like the most awkward human being in the world in that picture. Um, but yeah, so. So uh, this, of course, leads over time, this interest in China moves from like textual interest specifically to, okay, well, what else can the Chinese experience teach us? And this is, uh, this is the, the one of many examples of a friendship association. 
Uh, you've got them, uh, one between China and Indonesia. You've got one between Mexico and China, Peru and China, which is, I'm looking at the Peru-China one right now, actually. Uh, the Association d'Amitié Canaro Chinois is one of the, Chinois is one of the big ones that emerges in 65. It's shut down two years later because Sihanouk sees it as an overtly Maoist organization. It was, to his credit. But it's, a, you know, this, this very kind of tight-knit group of, of Sinophile Cambodian students who want to take the examples of the experience of China and apply it to the concrete reality of Cambodia. And it's, it's outlawed in 67, but Hu Nim, who's one of the guys in the previous slide, he visits China uh, as well, and the Chinese really like his ideas, and he's the most overtly pro-cultural revolution, pro-Maoist of the group, and it's one of the reasons why Pol Pot has him executed uh, later. There's a long story there, but there's a schism within the party at some point, and whatever. It's also big in other places in Southeast Asia. Jose Maria Sison, a.k.a. Joma, Jomo Sison, or Amado Guerrero. Uh, he is the leader of the uh, Maoist Communist Party of the Philippines. He, um, like many of the other guys, who grew up in a rural setting, but he grew up in, in wealth uh, in a rural setting, uh, attends all these schools, uh, is told not to read progressive things like Marx and Lenin, so what does he do? He reads Marx and Lenin. And uh, he makes a pilgrimage to Manila, much like Nim made a pilgrimage to Paris, and then to Phnom Penh. And then in Manila, he becomes more interested in these works and joins uh, these, these study groups, right, these pro-China study groups. And by the 1950s, he's absolutely fascinated with what's going on, not just in China, but in Indonesia uh, with the Communist Party of Indonesia that's now slowly gotten back together after years and years and years of dormancy. And he's saying, well, you know what, why don't we do this in our country, which is, you know, corrupt and we got to fix these issues. So to kind of speed through these, these last examples, because I'm running out of time, uh, he does a lot of the same things that the Cambodian communists are doing in their early years before they take state power. He's trying to wed it to the uh, concrete reality of the Philippines. Uh, he actually takes over um, uh, the, a large wing of the youth, uh, the, the youth sections of the of the existing Communist Party, and then founds his own Maoist offshoot. And uh, they're actually like they're still in existence, uh, and the fight's ongoing. Um, he's of course distanced himself now. There's even even more hardcore group that's leading it. But um, there's just some pictures uh, and of their logos and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, uh, mainly in Mindanao, they're they're ongoing. I would have loved to go into this more. Uh, I mean, China and Africa is a big, big one. I mean, the picture is familiar from the poster. But there are so many examples of China just in the 60s and 70s going to countries like Tanzania and Zambia and, and just making these large, um, you know, these large investments in, in building projects and infrastructure and saying, you don't have to pay us back. And the, one of the main, main examples is the Tazara Railway, which links Tanzania and, and Zambia. And the... The railway there, uh, one of my favorite kind of anecdotes about it is, is that uh, the, the workers were allowed to take as many breaks as they want as long as they were reading Mao's Little Red Book when they were on break. <laughs> so, so the, and, and uh, so, I mean, in, in Dar es Salaam in the 60s, you have, even though Nyerere, Julius Nyerere, the president of Tanzania, is not a Maoist, um, he's, uh, Dar es Salaam is filled with Maoists and Mao, little, you know, a cultural Revolution pins and and, and uh, English versions and French versions of Mao's Little Red Book. So this idea of of, of China is, is here for you and and you know the, the kind of the symbolisms of the figures in those pictures there are all resonant. Of course, China has a lot to gain from uh, not having a U.S. presence or a Soviet presence in many African countries. This also happens to the Black Panthers. I would have loved to just devoted the hour to the Black Panthers because I'm a, a little bit of an obsession with them. Um, uh, this is a, a big movement that kind of uh, it, it ex explodes in, in, in Oakland, uh, Bob Seale and Huey Newton, uh, much like the other examples, try and take those nuggets from Mao's thought and apply them to the concrete reality specifically. For them, it's the African-American experience. And, uh, th you know, they, they drop this, this, you know, they emphasize class, uh, you know, struggle as well uh, as, as part of that struggle, uh, of, 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 you know, against oppression. And um, obviously there are a lot of uh, things that kind of derail the movement, as, you know, the, uh, we can get into that afterwards. But, but the, the key feature there is that every party member had to study Mao's Little Red Book, which, again, mass translated 
and carried around. And so Maoism becomes very central to the Black Panthers um, and, uh, you know, eventually inseparable from it. It also makes its way to, Para, uh, to Peru in Lima. Uh, you have the Sendero Luminoso movement, which, uh, again, for sake of time, I'd love to go into more, but uh, they almost take state power in, in the late 70s and early 80s until they're defeated. Now it's, I just gave a talk in Lima about Sendero Luminoso, and it's a very sensitive topic there. They still view them as, as state terrorists and traitors. So to talk about them in any light that's not uh, overwhelmingly critical, and I am critical of them, absolutely. But uh, even to just like say, let's maintain objectiv objectivity to the most uh, we can is hard. It's really hard to do. Uh, the Naxalites in West Bengal uh, are uh, kind of a, an Indian Communist Party that's very influenced by Mao. There's actually some of the best stuff about Maoism today is coming out of that movement, like just theoretical works. Very interesting. So some pictures of some kind of cultural revolution light rallies held by the Naxalites. And even today, Bo Lai, I mean, I guess he's not politically relevant anymore, but this is a guy who was kind of the epicenter of a Maoist revival, so to speak, only a few years back. Mm -hmm. And he was calling for the return of red songs from the Cultural Revolution, right? And the Chongqing experiment was such a hallmark of some of the great things that the Mao era had done coming back to life now. Um, and, you know, people still carrying around those posters of Mao, obviously it's po highly politicized. Um, those posters tend to come out when China and Japan have a border dispute, um, hearkening back to, of course, Mao's own defeat of the Japanese. <coughs> but yeah, just to sum up, again, we've got these these, poor, these important foreign policy shifts, and even de like these developments domestically in China in terms of how they're moving their, the slow work of their revolution, how it moves globally, and how it's in, even today, you can argue, is still ongoing. I certainly would. Um, and then these, these, these the, kind of these different periods of it uh, the, with the Bandung spirit and whatnot. So uh, I think the, the most important kind of conclusion on, on that big list there is the last one. Mao's identification of China as a third world and non-aligned country positioned it as a positive force, at least in their view, and for other countries as well, a positive force, that could help non-aligned recently independent countries break the cycle of dependency on either the Soviet Union or, or, or uh, the United States. For many countries, they still hold these friendship associations. There's still one in Lima for a Peru-China friendship association. So, I mean, and there's, there's still one, and I believe there's still one for Mexico, too. And these are still very politicized friendship associations. All right, so. Um, Alkunjaran, thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm sorry if I went over, and I look forward to your comments and feedback. to offer perhaps a few comments or questions, and then she's actually going to be taking questions from you. Okay. Um, my name is Shikhe Xiang. I'm an assistant professor here in uh, foreign languages and literature department, teaching modern Chinese literature and film. So I'm sure some familiar faces here, and welcome. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you, you know, uh, Dr. Gawi to give us such a rich, uh, concrete lecture today. And uh, I don't know how you think, but from my personal I mean, perspective, I feel like I travel a lot, you know, uh, on the world map, you know, Africa, Latin America, South Asia, and as Beijing, Shanghai, Shanghai. Historically, right, it's layout, the historical and geopolitical layout is fascinating. And also I want to mention before I you know, throw a question or collect your questions, I want to make a very, uh, uh, very brief comment. Uh, this talk is not just, uh, not only historically interesting, it is also very relevant for today, for us to understand, to comprehend today's Chinese politics. Okay? Just to give you a, a very quick uh, reference, last week, uh, China just elected the Chinese Communist Party, just elected its new leadership uh, the, with the General Secretary Xi Jinping, the Xi Kuo. Now they uh, uh, put that into the uh, the Dang Zhang, the yeah. Communist, uh, you know, the, the, their law, Xi Xixiang, yeah. Xi Jinping Xixiang. So the Xi thought it's like the Mao thought, right? Only rhetorically you could see the comparison the uh, similarity here. This is after four decades, nearly four decades in China, there's the second, 
for something called salt, named after a Chinese communist leader. Even Deng Xiaoping is not uh, you know, ele elevated to that status, Deng Xiaoping Li Lun theory, not Jiang Zemin, not anyone, only Xi Jinping. So if you want to, I know many of you interested in international relations, in the pop uh, public policy or politics, you really should <laughs> read his book, if he has a book coming out, to understand contemporary Chinese politics. They are following certain pattern, right? Not very long ago, not uh, 2,000 years ago, but the very recent, it's Mao Zedong, as the founder of the PRC, right? His thought, his theoretical system, his way, dealing with you know, the foreign countries, is still treasured by the core of the communist leaders. Sometimes they take it a view from the right, sometimes they take a perspe perspective from the left. Okay. So um, uh, uh, that's one. Uh, an another sh very short comment. It's also, uh, I mean, uh, inspired by your, your uh, comparison about the rhetoric. You know, Xi Jinping uh, promoted this thought, this kind of say, strategy first. They call it one by one road. Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. One by one road. So basically, China is looking to develop its economy and also, as long, I mean, along with its political influence along the old Silk Road mm -hmm. from China, the Central Asia, right? Xinjiang, all the way to Europe. And the other one is called the, uh, uh, the Oversea uh, uh, Silk Road. That's going to the Southeast Asia. Yeah. One Bell, one road. So at the first, the Chinese Communist Party called it One Bell, one road strategy, or One Bell, one road agenda. Very recently, they changed it to One Bell, one road initiative. Why? They explained, they said, this is not our this is not just our Chinese agenda. This is not just our political, you know, geopolitical strategy. We want this in initiative. We call upon other people, you know, from other countries to join in this. So they say this as the community to work towards a community of a common destiny. Well, you could try to understand it, right, on a rhetorical level or on a critical level. But that's the start. Okay, that's my very short comment, and I do have questions for her, but I would love, you know, uh, it's 6.30, we're <coughs> still very excited, <laughs> so please, uh, you know, I will take the questions and try to moderate for the lecture. Um, I have a question about your framing. Um, I know that you're supposed to talk about slow work here, but when I think about that period of Chinese history, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural mm -hmm. Revolution, there's nothing slow about it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering whether there is like some disjuncture between like the domestic policy that China was having at that point with mm. the international mm. diplomacy, or mm. what's going on? Mm. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, there's no denying the Great Leap Forward was anything. Slow, uh, and that might be one of the reasons why it was such a catastrophic failure. Um, but uh, I mean, Mao never thought that the Great Leap Forward was the end, right? Um, he, before the Great Leap Forward, you had uh, like I guess they call it informally the Little Leap, the Xia Yue Jin. Yeah. Yeah. So which was ended. They stopped it early because they thought that they had succeeded, and they there were already plans for another leap forward after that, right? So. But the Great Leap Forward's big goal, of course, was to, to meet and even surpass uh, industrial output of the United States and yeah, Britain, right? So the, the goal was to catch up or even surpass. Mm -hmm. But as in, in the interest of, 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 of Mao's fundamental pillar of permanent revolution, the next step would then to be to, you know, go further with it, right? And thank goodness that wasn't the case. I mean, not to say that the Cultural Revolution wasn't also um, highly controversial and, and, and there were problems there, but, but yeah, I mean, there, in terms of the Great Leap Forward and industrialization, sure, but uh, in terms of the, the greater socialist experiment of China, that is still ongoing, that permanent revolution is still ongoing, and um, the international, the importance of, or, or China's role internationally in influencing um, these, these experiments in socialist development is also still somewhat ongoing. Um, though it's, I guess now there's a lot more dollars and they have to repay, uh, they have to repay this time. So, so I think, yeah, certainly in some aspects there's a disjuncture, but I, I mean, theoretically there's still continuation. Can I just say a few words? About yeah, this yeah, question. Uh, economically, uh, there is a general and common uh, 
obviously, uh, recognition. It's, like you said, it's disaster. And uh, uh, the economic professor, Yao Yang, in Beijing University, he recently in his uh, book is called it's Extremely Catch-Up Plan. So as you mentioned, it's not small at all. It's too fast. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at it from a different perspective, a great leap forward coincides with the so sino soviet split, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mao is calling for decentralized, decentralization. Why? Because they follow the Soviet model first, so-called the first five-year plan. So from 1950 to 1955, they follow the Soviet model to give a lot of power to those, you know, uh, 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 bureaucrats in a factory or in an organization or in an institution. Now, politically, you know, the geopolitical uh, 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 relation changes, right, as uh, Dr. Gao mentioned in his talk, the sign of Soviet split is the fundamental point when China pursued its own path. Neither, China, neither Soviet Union, neither US, we want to search for our own road. This is so-called a non-aligned, uh, 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 non-alignment. <coughs> so decentralization, which means now it's not that an essential committee is going to hold the power. We are going to give to the common workers or small production team. In a very, you know, in a very good uh, uh, intention, but <laughs> in practice, mm -hmm. now back to the very important pattern theory, pack practice theory. Yeah, absolutely. They scale back after the the, the famine, the great famine. Why? Because in practice, this theory doesn't work. So coming back. Something I would have loved to talk more about. I got it in there. And just, of course, the, the opportunity to talk about Ho Chi Minh and Sicarno is too great. So, But yeah, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And it, there was always plans to, to keep going. I mean, one of the things I love talking to my undergraduates is, is I say, who opened China up during the reform period? Who is the one who's the great mm -hmm. innovator? And they, everyone says Deng Xiaoping. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what if I told you it was Mao who, built, who yeah. designed the machine and started building it? Hua Guofeng picked up where he left off. And then Deng Xiaoping just pressed the on button. <laughs> what if I told you that? And then everyone's like, no, no, it's Deng Xiaoping, my other professor of China, who's, who's got the job at UBC. You're just a PhD student. I'm like, no, but look at, look at what's going on in the cultural revolution. There's a lot of that continued development that's going on. Mao is laying the framework for that to happen. And that he sees uh, the next logical step. And then uh, after, after uh, you know, the, the outbreak of the Cultural Revolution, even before that to some degree, just, just that catastrophe of the Cultural Revolution, or the Great Leap Forward, sorry, really sets them back. And again, that de-emphasizing the gradual permanent struggle and, and emphasizing so much on doing what the Soviets did is one of the big kind of epic failures of, of Chinese socialism in practice. Right? It is only when it's, Mao's really emphasizing, well, we've got to do the Chinese road to socialism. Let's, let's, let's not do this Soviet thing anymore. That's, that's when things start to get. And it's a, a struggle that takes them all the way up to the Cultural Revolution, for sure. Very good, very good question. Uh, is the Xi thought seen as an evolution of the Mao thought, or are they seen as being set against one another? Xi? Xi Oh, Xi? Yeah. Oh, OK, for me? Uh, well. It's really complicated. I think rhetorically, of course, he's following Mao. But he is not as radical as Mao will call for war revolution. The word, the phrase that he picked is following the United Nations. It's called a, a community of shared destiny, or a community of, uh, uh, what is the, uh, the word? Uh, common destiny. So common, now, yeah. it's community. We are community. I don't think. Well, many people, you know, really now trying to digest <laughs> what is at the bottom of the heart of Xi, you know, who knows? We will see, you know, in practice, again, not just a look at what he is talking, but in practice, we will see. I mean, actually, that's the one question I want to give to you. Would you like to talk about something about the third world theory today, especially concerning China's presence in Africa? I don't know whether you would feel interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I'll try and keep it short because I have a tendency to ramble. But um, I mean, this is a topic that's very relevant, very interesting. I, I, my my students uh, are are always coming to me when I talk to them about China's involvement in Africa. I gave actually a, a talk when I was uh, the teaching assistant for Ian Stewart back at UBC, and uh, I was so grateful for that opportunity to talk about kind of Sino-African relations. 
and it sounds so weird for me to say Sino-African. I mean, China's relationship with an entire continent with over 50 countries, that sounds so, you know, uh, Eurocentric. But um, the, it is an important relationship that had, dates back several centuries. You know, China's, Zheng He is traveling around uh, part of Capes of Africa. He's up in Mogadishu, in the, you know, the, during the Yuan Dynasty. Like, China was very much a, a, a globally interested empire, even before it was China. You know, that's what the Sinosphere was. But, but um, yeah, th there is a, a very big difference from what was going on. During the, the kind of radical ideological years of, of the Cultural Revolution in China, is trying to really actively inspire revolution and, and socialist development outside his country, there's a willingness to turn a blind eye to debt. And China's not necessarily looking at dominating uh, the market, so to speak. Um, companies are going over there, and the idea is always you know, to you know, serve the people, way rim and fool, mm -hmm. right? And this includes the world's people. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 80s and 90s, that initially well-intentioned Purpose remains, but now you got to put a, a price tag on it. And Chinese companies have replaced, with the reform and opening up, have replaced those kind of uh, socialist technicians and, and <coughs> social engineers. Uh, and, and they're there, and Africa is going to pay for it. So, my, the, hearkening back to those students, that was, isn't that a new form of neocolonialism? And I was like, yeah, you know, uh, let's, let's talk about that, because I find that an interesting topic, because I, I cannot say with full certitude because mm -hmm. I am not there on the ground doing the research on these Chinese companies in these places. But I can tell you, every time I go to places like uh, Belize or, 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 or Mexico uh, or, or Peru, you mm -hmm. go to the local uh, convenience store and it's actually not a convenience store. It's an everything, sells everything store and it's a Chinese company. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so I mean, there if not one way, it's another. So um, it's a fascinating dynamic and the book's not written on it yet. Uh, over the last seven years, I've, I've spent time in 22 different African countries, and and you see such you see this happening, such an exponential rise on on China's influence. Uh, in you know some some countries like France and the United States may have a, a, a satellite embassy, and China's building this big big thing that takes five five acres. You know, uh, so the influence, the sphere of influence, is, is really moving in there. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there is a price to pay for that. Uh, that's that's soon to be collected. Yeah. But uh, but I see it exponentially, over, even over the last seven or eight years, uh, moving moving strong in, in all these countries. I'm, I'm never one for speculation, but I wonder if that would have even you know ballooned to the size that it is now if the Soviet Union hadn't collapsed. Because no, you're absolutely right. With no Soviet Union, China is fills that vacuum like that. Right. Yeah. Right. And with the kind of the cooling of relations, or I guess, I guess the warming up of relations between China and this, the United States with the Nixon visit and everything, and, yeah. uh, and China saying, hey, get out of that chair, uh, Taiwan, or, you know, <laughs> Republic of China, this is the PRC seat. Uh, that eventually becomes like, okay, well, maybe the US isn't our rival ideologically, but commercially, we should keep our eye on them. So it's, it's a two-horse race in many of these cases. Europe is, is a player in some countries like Mali and whatnot, but I mean, you know, they're just <laughs> they're the old colonial masters, right? So. <laughs> um, uh, did the Chinese approach to non-ideological diplomacy have any effect on US or Soviet diplomacy in softening their stances on those uh, third world countries? <coughs> Uh, it's a great question. In some in some cases, uh, especially towards the you know the Nixon visit and everything, yes, uh, the rise of triangulation and whatnot. And I could go on and on about the boring stuff involving Kissinger. Ugh. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but in the in the sixties, there is this there is this fear that the the United States actually believed that China was a Moscow surrogate. They believed that what China was doing was directed by Moscow for a long time. Mm -hmm. So during the 50s, leading up to the kind of the early 60s, there, the United States is, is, is funding these anti, virulently anti-communist uh, organizations like SIATO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Uh, and uh, you know, they're, they're kind of promoting countries that aren't thinking about socialism. 
and, and there's also the US, uh, USAID, which is, or is it, the, it might just be the USID, I don't know, but it's, it's a, uh, a, a support program that funds uh, the anti, <laughs> it funds uh, Chinese communities in Southeast Asia that are either pro-nationalist or anti-communist mm. to, to counter the presence of pro-communist Chinese, because of course, so many Chinese in Southeast Asia, it's a very big diaspora. It's a, how do you really get in there, right? So there, there are a lot of efforts that happen, uh, specifically among Kwa Tiao, the overseas, overseas community that the United States seeks to do. Um, but uh, as, they're, as they start to realize that China's actually you know, breaking with the Soviet Union, which I, I guess the, the boiling point is 1960, they start to be like, well, you know, like we got to fight the Soviets. They're the main real issue here. And China's doing this five principles thing. We'll take them at their word for now, but keep a watchful eye on them. And eventually, of course, they just let it go. Uh, you talked a lot about how Mao was uh, really promoting these neutral, neutrality ideas mm -hmm. in the face of the Cold War. Um, I had often seen it framed that Mao was sort of the, you know, the USSR's sort of horse in that race, and Jiang Jiechi was more the uh, more America's. Uh, would you say that the idea of neutrality predates him at all, like in Sun Yat-sen, or did he really not have an opinion on in, in terms of the Cold War and that dynamic? I mean, you could certainly argue that, you could argue that about Mao Zedong Sisyon. I mean, John Fitzgerald certainly does, Henrietta Harrison certainly does, that, that there's actually nothing really that innovative about Mao's thought. But Sun Yat-sen, San Min Zhuzhui, is really the kind of fundamental base of, of, of Maoism. Um, and it goes without saying that if, if Sun Yat-sen uh, is such a huge influence, why not that neutralism? Absolutely. I mean, you have, you have a lot of that, especially among these kind of great pillars of the Republic in China, uh, these the, who, you know, are socialist curious in many ways. I mean, many people translate Min Xiong as socialism, mm -hmm. of, you know, Min Chuan and Min Zhu are, are very clear. I mean, Min Zhu, I guess it's debatable now, but, <laughs> but, uh, but Min, Min Xiong is always socialism in many ways. So, um, you know, people's livelihood standards are good. So I could, I could certainly see a, a, a neutralism stemming from that. Um, I know that, um, Mao obviously is a great admirer of Marx, Lenin, and <coughs> Stalin, specifically Stalin. He believes Stalin was a great theorist, and he sided with the Soviet Union, obviously, because revolutions need backing, right? And the Soviet Union had a lot to gain from not having a U.S. ally in the most populous nation in the world right on their border. Um, so, yeah, but he, the break with the Soviet Union, which really, I guess it starts in 53, or uh, starts just before 53, um, actually, the late 40s, early 50s, the Soviet invasion of Hungary and Czechoslovakia really alienates Mao because he believes, he believes that is socialist imperialism. Yeah. He's like, you guys have forgotten your way. Yeah. And then Khrushchev is just not, like, he's like meeting with the Nixon over the kitchen, and they're like, guys, what are you doing? What is this whole destroy capitalism business going on if you're, not, if you're gonna meet and be chummy with these guys? So I, I think his... his Yes, the Soviet Union and China, of course, are supporting each other, um, but Mao is, 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 you know, again, his, his, his allegiance is very much to Chinese socialism, uh, whatever form it's taking, and he does make some errors in implementation with, you know, following the Soviet road, but, um, yeah, until, until Stalin's, you know, kind of invasion he, and, and the, the eventual Sino-Soviet split, the Soviet Union, he views it as an ally. Uh, I would, our time is up, but I would invite you to come up and talk with yeah, us yeah, I'm here. individually. We're, we're not going to be like running out of here, so yeah. come up and keep firing away with your questions.